I decided to become an architect, I guess, when, when, when the Seagram building was uh, in question. And, uh, well, my father was head of Seagram. And we had talked, I was very interested. I was, you know, to me, you do things and you must make the world much better. You must, you know, have wonderful things. And uh, so we talked about it a lot. And then that Easter, I met my father in, he, I was in Rome and he came and we looked at the Palazzo Farinese and things like that. And then uh, that summer, I got an email, or not an email, that was before email, well before, this was 1954. And I got a document from him. I can't quite remember exactly what it was because I don't have it. And uh, this is what we're going to build, or this is the building we're going to have. And I was totally appalled, totally appalled. I mean, it was so vile, it was so disgusting. And so I immediately went to London to um, uh, look at um, it's the RIBA, the library. Then I wrote him a huge, long, eight-page, tightly, uh, single-page, uh, single-line letter talking about, uh, you know, um, the that Renaissance and the, uh, uh, you know, the change of attitude from, you know, God was the center of the world to the man being the center of the world. And uh, then, then I started looking at what was around uh, in the letter. I criticized this building uh, that was sent to me in a kind of like two kind of um, uh, yokels uh, uh, looking at it. So I, I tried to make it funny. Uh, and, and, then, and then then, then I s started thinking about the buildings. And I said, well, there, are, there is the Lever House in New York, and there is the UN building in New York, and those are of glass. And these why there's a glass, the buildings are heavy, but why should they, why do they have to look heavy? Why can they not be, you know, the reflection? And uh, so I, I was just thinking this through. Anyway, this long letter came, I don't know how much he read of it, but anyway, he said, come back and choose marble. I said, oh no, I'm not doing any of the sort. <laughs> and my mother said, why don't we ask Phyllis back? Maybe she could do something. Anyway, from there on in, I, uh, I, I I convinced uh, actually the contractor for the building, who was a great guy, Lou Carnot, uh, that uh, you know how much I knew and how much I cared and my passion for mm. it. So he sort of said to my father, "She ought to do the research for the architect." And th that I did for two, six, let's see, six weeks. And did uh, Mies van der Rohe emerge as the very obvious choice, or was it a close? Was it a close? Uh, well, it was battle? very. Uh, the only closeness was there was always. Le Corbusier in the edges. I didn't go to see Le Corbusier uh, at all, but I, 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 there was always that. And uh, uh, it was tempting, but I said, no, no, Le Corbusier concrete and that kind of sculptural aspect is not something that would really be work on Park Avenue and be good as a element in, in America. So, um, as a model. So. But Mies, but all the younger architects, you know, because we, 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 we had a whole a group of uh, architects. Eero Saradin one day was at Philip Johnson's very early on, and I went up for, for the weekend. And so they, he was a list maker, so there were the arch, those who should and couldn't, those who could and shouldn't, and those who should and could. So I sort of went through this list of people, plus some of the, you know, the big, horrible firms that were doing things because I was asked to do that by the, the Fuller Company. So anyway, it was, it was a marvelous, marvelous time. And what was uh, what was Mies like when you when was that the first time you met him yes, as a result of this no, research? No, of course, of course. So you, you went to see him in his office in his apartment. Actually, I didn't see him. In his, I saw him at luncheon next to his apartment at a hotel, which no longer exists. He was a he was a generous. He is a, he is a generous. He was a generous man. Mm. And there was an aura. You know, there are people who have auras and you just get a sense of this, that is somebody, and that was what he was like. I think this comes across in the photographs of him. I mean, yes. there, there's a sort of solidity or, or gravitas um, about <laughs> his whole image. He said that about himself. He said, he said, you could, he said I'm like an oak tree. You can change me as, you, as little as you can change an oak tree. <laughs> well, that's an extraordinary story, and, and in a way, um, writing, the, writing the history of architecture of the 20th century, one would say, well, that's 
a chapter and that would have been as much as one might have expected from any client who found themselves in a, unexpectedly really in that sort of position. Uh, but of course the other uh, great contribution that you have made and, and for which the Golden Lion is being awarded um, is the work of the CCA which starting from nothing um, became the most significant architectural archive and in, in a sense a kind of living history um, of, of contemporary architecture based in Montreal, your hometown. Where was the inspiration for that? Was that something that gradually built up as an idea or was, it, was there a moment when you thought there's something missing and I know what it is? Well, it's sort of a bit of, a bit of both because when I was working on the Seagram building, reading architectural drawings is not the, exactly a thing you do without some hard work. And so, you know, I was learning to read them and I thought, well, how do people, how do architects draw in other times, other places? And so it was a period when there were started to be architectural drawings. I must say most of them were decorative drawings, but not all. And uh, at auction, and a friend of mine was a rare drawings collector and I said if you see any architectural drawings let me know and so I started to collect these drawings and I started finally feeling a responsibility towards them I mean they survived so far and then there was a there was all that demolition all over the world after World War II traveling around you see buildings demolished you see one Victorian building in a vast area that had been demolished and I thought this is appalling. And I had also built a building, I was the architect of a building in Montreal. And so I visited Montreal again and I recognized that people lived downtown, there were these grey stone buildings. And so I started doing documenting with a, uh, a young photographer, a British photographer, who was in Chicago. And we started photographing the grey stone buildings in Montreal and then started doing research on them. At, and that turned into a whole other huge project. But uh, that, that, you know, you'd be standing on the corner looking at the Hotel Dieu, for example, with a uh, large format camera. And somebody would say, what are you photographing that building for? It's going to come down. And um, so I became very much involved in uh, stopping that. Well, one of the interesting things about architectural drawings is that at one level they're entirely about the future because at the time when they're made, the buildings don't exist. There are there are there are in the mind in the mind. Well, there is either Cedric Price or Rainer Bannum said um, architecture is about the history of the immediate future. <laughs> but of course, the archive then becomes in in the event of buildings being demolished, the archive becomes both forward-looking and backward-looking simultaneously. No, I mean, we don't do that. We don't try to get. Uh, we don't have our, uh, buildings in the archive because they're going to be torn down. We don't. I, ha I did huge documentation on Montreal, but through the building contracts and uh, th th that sort of thing, maps of the time. No, no, we, 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 we acquire work that is work of people who are pushing the boundaries and that are advancing things and um, uh, that are, are, are of interest to, uh, to study. But of course, when buildings are demolished, if the drawings are in your archive, it, you know, Faute de Mieux becomes a, it, it becomes a, a, another form of memory. Yeah, but I'm not, we're not interested in that. Uh, we're interested in what, what were they, what were the, what were the ideas people were promulgating? What was, where did it come from? How, how, what was the intellectual, emotive, uh, technical? What were these? What, what were people trying to do? What, did, what were they coming from? What were they trying to push forward? We only think of whether we think that these people are really significant in pushing towards the, the, the future and, and moving uh, forward things. So we, we have, you know, we have collections of architecture from the 16th century to the 19th century, but the 20th century is basically our archives. Cedric Price, Jim Sterling, Aldo Rossi, John Hayduck, Peter Eisenman. And then there are uh, 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 people from Spain now, and uh, you know, so it keeps on growing. And uh, these these drawings are pretty well donated to our collection now. And, 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 and I think the thing is, we call it a collection. We don't say collections because the the, the, the publications 
the drawings, the photographs, you know, all of those things are, they cross over. After the war, anything could happen. And that was a fascinating period. And I, I tried to, in, in the book on C, the Seagram, building Seagram, I tried to give that background, you know, it was just tremendous. And uh, you, know, you couldn't do that now. You really couldn't do all, all that we did there. But it was great, it was great to draw this picture. You can do other things now, you see. So, it, you shift and change. and there, 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 That was kind of a period of discovery of architecture in the United States, certainly and the rest of the world. I mean, a, a Bauhaus had happened, and that was the background of it. But uh, now there is a whole uh, new sense, of course, with the computer and the new materiality that's developing, and the huge, huge, huge problems of overpopulation in cities that grow, you know, uh, geometrically. And uh, so this is a whole other, how, how do you how do you work? And this is, I think, what Rem was trying to address at his exhibition. Uh, the CCA is essentially concerned with an analogue world, if we could put it like that. But of course now um, architecture has become digital, the way we think about cities, the way we plan the them is the to CCA, do with... The CCA is pioneering the archiving of, uh, of uh, computer-generated in the machine drawings, not as, a, uh, not as a tool to make drawings, but in the machine development. So we have had our second, we had our first, uh, I guess last year, exhibition of the archaeology of the digital with uh, Peter Eisman and parametrics and Frank Gehry and his wonderful kind of models that he made to try and understand and other, other people. And this year we have a, a new one, which is uh, m much less architectural forms, much more parametrics and uh, also uh, uh, design concepts and things like that. Well, I think it's a, a, a marvelous thing that um, an institution uh, which is devoted to looking at how other people have pushed boundaries in their field is itself uh, an example of precisely the same attitude in its approach to architects, to architecture, and the future. Phyllis Lambert, thank you very much indeed. That's a nice way of saying it. Thank you very much.